Jeff Probst. Uh, I work with All Texas Consulting. In fact, I'm the president of the company. And uh, you might have heard about us from Friday night when we sponsored the beer share. So, thank you. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, Salt Stack, specifically a tool built into it called Salt Cloud, which lets you provision VMs very, very rapidly without thinking about it. Uh, we have to go through a little bit uh, of introduction about Salt Stack to make sure we're off to speed. Is anybody here not used Salt Stack before? Okay, we have some. All right, so we're going to do a very high level overview because Salt Stack itself is very big, and we could spend three sessions just on Salt Stack, and we're trying to get into the deeper stuff. So um, we'll just start off with who I am. I have been involved in open source for, I don't know, 20 years now. Uh, like a lot of you, I got hooked on Linux way back long ago and couldn't stop playing with it. And when I got the opportunity to do it professionally, I said, yes. So I've been professionally Linuxing for about 12, 13 years, somewhere around there. Um, like I said, I am the president of Off Axis Consulting. I am a longtime sysadmin. Uh, more recently, they've been calling us DevOps. I don't know why. Because no, forever, if you were a sysadmin, you kind of had to write scripts just to get your job done, right? So we put a label on it now, and it's called DevOps, and you're all familiar with it. Um, I'm not officially affiliated with SaltStack. I'm just a really big enthusiast. I've been using it for years, and I think it's a, a, an amazing tool, or an ecosystem even. So the little logo down here, I actually stole it off of their website. By steal, I'm putting that in quotes because they actually allow you to do so. So... Does your deployment process look anything at all like this? Mine has in several different companies, and it's terrible. So what we're going to do today is talk about how to untangle that, mostly with orchestration and salt cloud. We're going to get rid of this process entirely. We don't need that. We don't need the headache that goes along with it. And uh, there's probably 14 or 15 different people involved in this process, too. We don't need any of them either. We're going to get rid of all of that, right? So since we have some people who haven't heard about something, well, you've heard about it, but you don't know mostly about it. So let's talk briefly about what it is. It's one of the big four automation tools right up there with Ansible, Puppet, Chef. And there's others that are showing up on scene too, like Terraform is getting bigger. Um, I still consider it those the big four that we've been talking about for years here. It is written in Python, and it uses a zero MQ messaging library, which a lot of other tools do too. It's this... Um, it just makes everything very easy. You don't ever have to think about how things are connected. It just kind of works. So it's a beautiful way to handle things. It is based upon the master minion architecture, like Puppet and Chef is, unlike Ansible. And you have to run an agent on your minion for it to work. It is extremely modular to a fault sometimes, which lends itself to uh, expansion and extension in wonderful ways that are extremely complicated and difficult to document, some of which we might run into today. And it is available for just about every major operating system, including all flavors of Windows that I think are still in modern production. You can run SaltStack and operate a Windows machine using SaltStack. I've never tried it, but I really try to avoid adjusting or messing with Windows wherever possible anyway. So, so what does SaltStack do? You're defining your infrastructure and processes with code, just like in other systems. You're declaring states. You're declaring what... Thing, what a thing should be in. So a server should have Nginx installed. A server should have this configuration file in that spot owned by this user with these permissions. You just declare these things and you create a procedure by chaining these declarations together and you can even declare the order you need them to be in. Like it doesn't make sense to create an Nginx configuration file if you don't have Nginx installed. So naturally you want to install Nginx first and then modify the config that's already there. So you're running the salt command on the salt master. There are ways to do an API. There are Ansible Tower, I think is something people have used a lot. There are equivalents in salt. I haven't used it. I just always stay in the command line. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to do entirely command line. And when you run your salt command, whatever states you've told it to do, it makes it so. We'll look at that in a second. So let's talk about salt cloud. It is a separate tool. It is technically included in the salt stack software, but it's a separate invocation. It has its own configuration files. It does provision VMs on public and private clouds. I mean, any provider you can think of, they'd probably have support for it right there in 
salt stack uh, official. And there's, of course, because we said it was extendable, if you have some infrastructure as a service vendor that isn't supported, well, you can go copy something from another vendor and kind of modify it so it works. This also means you can do things like practice running your salt stack states on a local virtual box. It doesn't matter what the vendor is. It doesn't need to be out of the internet. It could be local. Uh, I did a lot of my early work with Salt Cloud using a relatively local VMware stack. So all you have to do is make sure that the libraries, the Python libraries that are required to interact with that API are present on the system you're running Salt Cloud on. Now it's important to note, you don't need to run Salt Cloud on a Salt Master. You can run it from anywhere because it is a separate tool entirely. And as we'll see, it makes the most sense to run from a Salt Master, but you don't specifically have to do that. The big thing that we get from using Salt Cloud is that we're abstracting away the differences. So if I go make a call into Linode's API to make a new VM, that's a different API with a different invocation and different assumptions than Rackspace or AWS or anything like that. All these little differences, they add up. You know, you create a VM in AWS, most of you probably know, it's not enough to just create a VM. You also have to create a, you know, control group and, you know, rules because usually everybody has, they create their first T2 instance. They're like, why can't I reach this? I can't SSH into it because the network isn't hooked up. So you've got all these other things that go along with it to use AWS. Well, none of that is required in Linode. None of that is required in Rackspace. So what Salt Cloud does is, as long as you've set up your configuration properly, it just kind of makes all that disappear, which is why I like it so much. And as long as you have your vendor configuration files set up properly, you won't ever need to think about those things again, or very little. It is very tightly integrated with Salt, but because it's its own tool, it has its own configuration, we're going to dive into some of that in a bit. Um, but it's, it's important to know that it's calling into uh, the Salt stack objects in Python for a large part of its operation. Let's go look at some configuration files here. It really is the hardest part. This is the part that, unfortunately, you have to do this first before you can start operating it, which is why it works really well to start with their documented configurations and modify. That's what I usually do. You have to define a provider that you're going to be getting your VM from. So this is where some of the specific customization things come in. Um, so in our example later, we're going to be using Linode as our provider because they happen to be a sponsor. I figured that was very appropriate. You also have to define what your VM is supposed to look like in the form of a profile. Like um, with, with Linode, you declare the size of it. You know, they have it named like two gigabytes, four gigabytes, however much RAM you're getting with it. That's how they name it. So you would declare a profile. I want a machine that is of this kind of Linode size. I want it at this location, and I want all these parameters, and then I also want to attach some configuration onto it that gets included in it when we run. And there's a third part of this that mostly happens automatically, but if you start getting very deep into Salt Cloud, you may start modifying this. Um, when you create a new VM with Salt Cloud, the default is for it to run the Salt Stack Bootstrap script, which rapidly downloads the, all the things it needs, the packages, configuration to run Salt Minion, and then hooks it up to your Salt Master. But you don't have to use that deploy script. You can write your own. And uh, when I was first starting to use this, I didn't really pay attention to the existing deploy scripts and wrote my own, and that took a lot longer. So I do advise you, if you can, use what's already in there. Start with the salt bootstrap and just piggyback onto it if you can, but you're not required to. Uh, hopefully you won't need to go too deep into that. There are, I can show you later, there are example deploy scripts for people that don't want to use just salt bootstrap, and they're built into the code base in an interesting location. And they discourage people from using it, but it's good for you to know where they are just in case you have to go there. So this is kind of the overview of what a config looks like for Salt Cloud. There's this basic um, Etsy Salt Cloud file, and that's the top. Whatever you declare there is present for every single invocation, every single thing you're going to use. So you declare, I, sh I should mention this, in Salt Stack, your configurations aren't broken up into little pieces. It's basically all combined into one massive YAML. And so it means you can throw anything you want pretty much anywhere as long as you've labeled it properly and you tell Salt, oh, this is the label you should go look for for that particular configuration. So in Salt Cloud, what we tend to do is break it up into providers because we don't want to all cram it together. 
and we have individual profiles. Again, there's no reason we couldn't stick it all in that Etsy salt cloud file, but it makes a lot of sense to break it out. So and we'll go look at those. Actually, let's go look at those right now. How do they expect me to type in microphone at the same time? I don't understand. Anyway, all right. One-handedly, I'm going to show you. Here is my simple configuration for the Linode provider. Yes, it is an active API key. Please don't copy it. It'll expire inside of 12 hours, so don't try and look at it later. But I'm setting up a couple key things here that needs to know what driver to use. In this case, the Linode driver. That makes good sense. Now, I've confused the heck out of myself by actually naming it wrong. If you want to confuse your coworkers, you could name uh, this rack space and use the Linode driver and confuse the out of them. I've, I think of devious ways to do this. Anyway, you have to declare the driver to use. In this case, we're, we're using the Linode driver, which understands the Linode API. You have to give it the API key here, because otherwise it has no idea to, how to authenticate you. And at the very least, you have to tell it a root password that it's supposed to give to every system. Now, there are ways to make it per system root password and ways to inject SSH keys and all these other things that were, make good sense as far as automation and security go, but we're just starting high level. We're just going to set a default root password. And let's see, look at profiles. And this is a very simple profile for the smallest Linode you can get today. I'm using the provider that I declared in the other file that you just saw. Again, that's just a label, so you can name it whatever you need. If you have multiple uh, API keys with a node, you can create multiple providers with different labels, all using the same driver, and depending on which one you're supposed to use, use that one. Maybe you have multiple accounts. Maybe your company wants to create a, a Linode account or a Rackspace account per division or per software team so they can kind of do their accounting separately. Well, no problem. Just create multiple providers, give them different names, and specify the right provider in the machine profile right here. We're declaring the size as Linode 2 gigabyte. And I'll show you where we get that from in a second. Uh, this is the image to use. And that's, that's a name that comes from Linode. And the location. Again, all these are things that come from Linode. And as a final little cherry, we're going to tell it exactly where to go to connect to its master. So I've given it an IP. Uh, I probably should stick a domain name in there. But just for our demonstration, I spun this new salt master up real quick. And that's the IP of it. So that is the provider and the profile in a very quick nutshell. All right, so we have now hypothetically set up Salt Cloud. Let's figure out how to operate it. There are a couple key commands that do, does not matter which provider you're working with. There are some baked in commands that every provider should support. One of them is listing your existing nodes. So you need to know, I've already spun up this machine before. Am I going to clash? Well, I'll just run this command and it will, oh, I forgot to put on the provider. Whoops. You have to tell it what provider to use. Sorry, um, but there's a couple of these commands that are kind of important, so you can always tell what nodes you have already spun up. And of course, if you're trying to create a new VM, you always use this particular invocation. You need to tell it the profile that you're going to create the machine in. And remember, we saw the profile declares its relationship to the provider, and you have to give it a name, and that's it. That's all there is to it. Now, if you want to create multiple VMs, you just Write the extra names with a space between them, and it'll create as many VMs as you tell it. Or you can create a cluster using a map file, which that's what we'll do towards the end of this presentation. A map file is yet another simple YAML file declaring, using this profile, create this system, and here's some parameters for you. We'll look at that in a second. Now, since we're using Linode as our example provider, there are some Linode specific commands that the driver understands. And these will be different for each provider. Oh, oh we already covered this. I'm going to skip that. Here are some specific things for Linode that you'll use. In fact, let's uh, go check these out. This is how you know what to name. Oh, come on, stop that. This is how you know what to name the instance or, or what instance you're creating. All right, I'm going to put this down just a second, OK? I need to ask a favor. Can someone come and hold this microphone for me? I don't know how they expect us to do this.
Thank you. Like reasonably close. So let's just go up here. I can't hear me on video. Oh. I, I'm, I guess I'm needing a microphone stand. Can you be a human microphone stand? Okay, great. We have a human microphone stand. Let's thank our human microphone stand. Thank you. Let's see. So this is the uh, salt master that I created that is local to the system. This is on my uh, VMware machine, or my VirtualBox machine. Actually, that's not what I want. Let's go here. Look like this. Okay, so I'm just going to run some of these commands to show what is expected. So we have our SRU that we declared this Linode API as a provider. And this is going to tell me all the possible locations you can create a VM in. And it comes out in typical salt stack style with happy colors and very difficult to read if you've got a small window like this. Can you guys see all the text? Do I need to make it larger? We're good? Okay, great. So let's see. Other commands we have is sizes. So, and we'll pipe that to less. Oh, I took my colors out. Oh, oh well. So there are ways, if you want to get into it, to print this out in different formats. Like if you were trying to consume this by um, a different script, then this wouldn't be a very friendly format for you to consume, right? You can tell Salt Stack and Salt Cloud, don't use the typical output or use uh, the JSON outputter, and it would give you something that's a little more digestible. So if you're starting to chain these things into automation, you'll want to use those features. For right now, we're just demonstrating what it looks like. So we have all these different possible uh, Linode options here, dedicated systems, keep going down past the dedicated. Here's the regular size ones, Linode 16 gigabyte RAM. And this command, it didn't used to do this, this is nice. It's telling me how many are available. I guess it doesn't specify by the location. If you don't care where your Linode is getting created, there are 500 possible uh, um, Linode 16 gigabyte RAM machines you can create. I'm pretty sure it's more than 500. They just probably cap it to make it easier to see. But you're going to need to copy this string out, like here. This, if I'm creating a 16 gigabyte node, I want to make sure I get it exactly right. This is the name that Linode's API uses when I'm creating a command or creating a VM. So I have to copy this into my profile. And images. Your arm getting tired? Oh, great. That's, that's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, so all these possible images you can spin up as a VM. And if you have self-declared images, this also gets included. Because I know some people, they don't like using stock images. They want to build their own thing. Or they're doing something aggressive, like a particular build of OpenBSD that's very cantankerous. But that's what they use. And so they've built the image in Linode. Yeah, sure. I mean, in Linode's API, it'll show you those because you're using the API key. And it knows what images you've created. So those will get included in here. So you would grab... The name, I'm not going to use Alpine. Let's go look for Ubuntu. Come on. There we go. So, wow, they're still supporting Ubuntu 14. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, people are still making those, I guess. So, you would grab this string out. And, you know, there's other information in here telling you if you're making API calls, it may would matter to you. The distribution has an ID of 124 or whatever. So, all this information can be gotten straight from this invocation, and then you would use that and plug it into your profile, which, by the way, you don't have to create a file to create your profile. You can actually spit it in on standard in. So if you're doing, like, this big, long automation pipeline, you can create a profile on the fly using what you found from your calls here, spit it in the salt cloud, and it would just run and do. Or you could create a map file, do that too. Actually, let's look at a map file real quick. Where's my map? So what? Oh, Stan would like to ask a question. Go ahead, Stan. All right. So we're looking at that, and you're saying that you look at the nodes, and then you can provision them. But can it see it itself and be identipotent? Like, if it already exists, it just won't, without having to go look it up, like, in an automated system? Is that available as a feature? That's a good question. That's a good question. Let's test that, shall we? <laughs> okay. So we're accelerating a little bit into our invocation. Um, let's see. I need to make sure I have my provider set up how I want. Grab my profile. We do. So we're going to create a machine, let's call it a um, new one. Okay, this is going to take a minute or so, so I'll keep talking while it's doing. It's, it's, it's a little sluggish. So I'll give your arm a rest. Thank you, human mic stand. While this is running, we'll talk roughly what it's doing. 
A good portion of this, unfortunately, is just making sure it's got the right contact to the API. It can be a little bit sluggish. And then, you know, it's not immediate. It, you know, they have to go in the back end and do all this other stuff, and they're trying to make this a roughly asynchronous call. Sometimes it takes longer than others. There's no promise in the API that when you make the call, you're going to get it immediately. There's Actually, they, I think they encourage you to use a more asynchronous style because sometimes it takes a while to spin up what you've asked for, especially if you're asking for something big with lots of storage. they got to zero out the storage. It can take a while. So there are asynchronous ways to invoke this API, and Salt Cloud does kind of understand how to do that. There may be some hacking in there. Uh, oh, I should also mention, if you're trying to follow these examples later, in Linode, they recently created a new cloud interface for their management, and they're directing everybody to use the cloud management portal. And the API keys that you create in that portal do not work here with Salt Cloud because Salt Cloud is still using the older style API. So don't get hung up on that. That kind of fooled me a couple weeks ago. You have to log back into the old manager, create an API key from that interface, which is using an older style API key, and then use that in your provider. Just make a note of that. So here we go. We've seen it deliver the VM already. Now this is actually um, sending back to us the console of what it's doing. It goes and creates the VM, logs in, installs everything it needs to get it bootstrapped up and become a salt minion. And here we're seeing it just go through all the various packages and jump, 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 jump. Here we go. Please go faster. It might be because there's a lot of people in the network right now. Going, going, going. Lots and lots of packages for some reason. Okay, I should mention, when we're spinning up a system and it automatically installs Salt Minion and configures it for us, it creates a very, very small configuration file. If you were to just go and install Salt Minion on a system, you can get this nice, well-documented configuration file with text on what every option does. If you create a system using Salt Cloud, it doesn't do any of that. It just creates the, the minimum required Salt Minion configuration. Uh-oh, what happened here? Oh, go away. Hey, it finished. Okay, great. So now we have a new system. And I should be able to SSH into it. Um, what was the password? This is really hard to do one-handed. Yay! Okay, so we here have a brand new system built by Salt Cloud, and we wanted to test what happens if we do the exact same thing again, right? Oh, question before we go on. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, and I typically would do that. Um, I just kind of skipped over that for this because I'm trying to make it, this is, if you just start out, this is what you're going to see, and you'll evolve very rapidly into using keys. There are options you can submit to the bootstrap script, like insert this SSH key into the root account. It supports that. Or specifically use this password. Or specifically create um, an automation user that's named this with this password and put the key into it. There's all these configuration options that Salt Bootstrap has. That, again, that's another rabbit hole. We could easily get lost in there, so I'm trying to skip over that some. So, all right, so we have verified we have a system, and we verified we can log into it. Let's do it again. I'm going to create the same thing again. Let's see what it does. Hey, look at that. Okay, it doesn't let us create it. You guys see that? That answers your question. It's at least intelligent enough to not create the next one. Cool. All right. Well, very good. Let's take a look at this um, new system of ours. All right. I think my mic's turned back again. Sorry. All right. This is what the minion configuration file looks like. It's very, very small. It's defining um, some metadata about where it came from, how was it invoked. Um, that's the default. I don't know why that's in there. Here's the idea of the system and the master. Okay, so now let's hop over to the master, and we should see a new system requesting. Oh, look at that. It already accepted it. That's a nice thing about Salt Cloud. One of the things about Salt Stack, when you create a new minion and you ask it to connect to the master, it doesn't just work because anybody could do that and point their system at your master and try and get in there. You have to accept that this minion is what you think it is and it's now accepted to be run by the master. When you use Salt Cloud, it just kind of handles that all for you. So we're seeing it's automatically accepted our new one key and we can run commands against it. Okay, and let's do, just run my core applications. 
So I have this kind of, I, I trimmed it up for our example, but you know, the default, this is what I expect the system to look like every time. I have, I'm very particular about my VimRC and ScreenRC, and so I want to make sure that's on every system. So that's in our core application. And we can set it up such that this is automatically run. Okay, good. Succeeded, succeeded, good. So now my system should behave as I expect it to. If it does behave like I expect it to, then this should be with a dark background. Oh, never mind. Try something else. Um, yeah, okay, good, there we go. And my VimRC, I, I tell it specifically that I'm gonna have a black, black background so that I have this nice light text. And this is just a simple way to test it. Sure enough, my VimRC is there. I suppose I could just look at the file. Yeah, let's go just go look at it. Oh, that's why. It's more than one. Yeah, so that file didn't exist before we ran that core application. And you can have it automatically run these things. Let's do, we'll see that when we do our cluster example here in a second. I'm gonna get out of the system here. Okay, good. we don't need you anymore. All right, I'm gonna hop back over to presentation. I don't know if I have anything on the map or not. No, I don't. Okay, so for those of you who might be watching later, I just stuck this slide in because pretty much the rest of this presentation is gonna be on just doing things. And there's no, there's no substitute for just jumping on a command line and showing you how these things work. So let's jump on and look at a map. All right, indeed my mic stand back again. His arm's probably pretty tired. Can we give him another round of applause for being a mic stand? Thank you, Mike Stan. Thanks, Mike. Yes, thanks, Mike. That's your new name. <laughs> really? Well, that's what. That's great. We're we're right in play. Okay. So, I have somewhere in here built a map, cloud map example. Here we go. So this is what a map file looks like. So I'm just declaring. I can declare any number of profiles and any number of systems based on those profiles. It's just very simple map. Literally, that's all it is. And of course, some of these things are going to be specific to your provider. Um, when I first started using Salt Cloud a couple years ago, I was doing almost exclusively um, calls against VMware. And so I would need to define things like, oh, I need this system to have four cores and eight gigs of RAM, and don't use the normal storage profile, use a different one, and it needs to be the size like this and put on that. Anyway, all of that would end up in, in here. So the interesting thing is, if I am using a profile that already has all that declared and it's right, I don't need to specify it in the map. It just inherits all that. In fact, that image we saw before, that inheritance flows down. Whatever you've declared in an, a higher file will show up in a lower file, and you overwrite only the imp information that's important. So it allows you to build this very hierarchical um, data structures where you don't need to define information. So, but here, since uh, in Linode, everything is just kind of baked into, it's a two gigabyte Linode, which means it's gonna have this much storage, and that, it's, I think it's just one core. We don't need to do any of that. So here we're going to create a cluster of two nodes. Um, we're gonna set it up. I'm gonna tell it to run in parallel so it'll create them at the same time. And here I have defined, uh, oh, I should say, a grain is um, SaltStack's fancy name term for a fact, like what you'd see in Ansible. They call them grains because they're trying to be cute, salt, grain, whatever. So we're declaring an extra grain here. In this case, I've set up, I'll show you in a second, I've set up a selector where it looks at this demo roll grain, and depending on the contents of it, it will run different automation. Let's go look at that real quick. Uh, states, here we go. Here we go. So every system that runs, when I tell it to apply a high state or something, it's going to run through this file and match everything it's gonna run every, every um, state file that we tell it to that it matches. So here, every system on the planet that is ever connected to SaltMaster, when I run, come up to the high state, it's always gonna run core every single time. So we always know our systems are at a base level. That's, a, that's just a good pattern to, to get into. Everything that your system should always have, stick it in core or name something similarly. And then here I've set up for our cluster demonstration we're going to do a match against the contents of that grain. If it is a web role, we're going to run the Nginx state. 
If it's a DB role, we're going to run the MySQL state. And right now, those states are very simple. They're just install the package, not configure it, because that gets really deep into some, some of the state stuff and the minutia. We don't want to get there. So literally, these states are just package installed. That's all it's going to do right now for a demonstration. But it should help illustrate that we're going to create this cluster and it's going to have these different roles. We could apply whatever states we want in this. So we can get as complicated as we want. Um, we could match against the name. So if I, if I know I was naming my systems a certain way, like every web system is going to be web dash something, then I could do, as my selector, I could do web dash asterisk and that would be fine. I tend to prefer using grains because names change. You know, let's say you're building a QA node and you you name it QA-web, well, that's not going to match your selector, right? So instead of using names, I find it preferable to use grains, which you declare when you're creating the VM. It just works a little cleaner, in my opinion. So let's go and actually run this map. Oops, I hit tab and it didn't complete. Whoa, have we lost our... Yeah, I need my, I need Mike back. Thank you, Mike. All right, here we go. Now, before I run and create a whole bunch of machines, it's asking me, sure. I think there's a dash Y option if you want to skip that for your automation efforts. So again, this is going to take a little while to spin up because now it's asking Linode to make it two, API, uh, two machines. Um, oh, I should mention, I, f I forgot an option that allows you to build in parallel because you're building a cluster, right? As long as there's an order doesn't matter, you can build them all at the same time. And in our case, it doesn't matter because they're not really linked. But let's say you're spinning up a cluster that you need uh, HA proxy out front and three web nodes and at least one DB, but possibly two, and you probably want a Redis instance in there somewhere because this is a really big site. So you want to have HA proxy set up first. So you would declare that first, and then you declare all of the web machines next, and then the DB, and then put the software on the web, and the order can be defined in the map file. So, all right, then, come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. And maybe it's tired. It's been busy this weekend. Come on, Linode, here we go. All right, anybody got any jokes while we got some dead time here? Mike, you got any jokes? That's okay, we got nothing to do. Come tell your joke. Okay, questions. Questions are better than jokes. What's your question, Mike? So my question is, we're talking about that the uh, salt cloud can stand alone from salt. So let's presume that we have a system that exists with a lot of Ansible playbooks. Can I use salt cloud provision and instead of putting the minion stuff on there, which I wouldn't need, just throw Ansible in there? Yes, you can. You would create a custom deploy script that does not create salt bootstrap. No matter what you do, the deploy script gets run by salt cloud. So if you want to use Ansible for the rest of it, because that's actually a use case I'm probably going to do later this year. We already have a heavy investment in Ansible, but Ansible does not have a Salt Cloud equivalent. So I would use Salt Cloud to create it and Ansible to provision it. At that point, I would create a custom deploy script, which actually I would probably do upload. Hmm. I would need to have some way to get the Ansible roles down to it and then run it locally, basically. So that would be a way to do it. There's no reason you can't do that. You would just need to customize the deploy script, and in your profile, you would specify, use this deploy, deploy script, not the default. Another question. Oh, even better. Salt has a module to run Ansible states. I haven't looked at that. Thank you. That's going to save me some time. I don't have to write a deploy script now. Another question or comment? Hmm. So Salt Stack itself does have that. Salt Cloud, I think, assumes you're starting from zero. But I haven't actually tested that use case. The question was, if you already have, say, a cluster that's built, but now you're changing the cluster makeup of some kind, you're adding a Redis server into it, could you just rerun the cluster map having added that Redis node? And I don't actually know the answer to that. So do you, do you know the answer, sir? OK, another question or comment then? OK. Uh, 
the question is, does it create a state that you can go back later and modify? And yes and no, it depends on how you're calling it. The way we have set up our map here, the, oh, come on, don't go quiet. So the way we have set up our map here, what it's supposed to do, and it, it may or may not, I'm not sure, it's supposed to create the node and then go and look, does this match the high state we expect it to be? And that's when it would go into that top at SLS file we looked at earlier, and then it would run the configuration. So you would just update the top at SLS or the state files, and the change would be incorporated the next time you run high state on that system. So I wouldn't say specifically Salt Cloud does that, but Salt Stack does. So does that answer your question? Okay. Oh, we're still running. Goodness. Okay. I thought by now it'd be done. It's 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 close. We'll just say this. It's very close. And this is going to spit out the summary of here's your two new systems, and it'll have the IPs, and we'll go check them out. So if it's set up properly, if it's actually installed the package we expect, then Nginx should be running on the web node, and MySQL should be running on the DB node. We'll see. Maybe. Say that again, please. I, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Why don't you come? Oh, gosh. Okay. Okay, he did come up with a joke. It takes a while to salt the earth. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. Maybe we need a collective groan to reward that wonderful pun. Uh, oh, gosh. Uh, this, there's a family of punsters over here. Oh, here we go. It finished. Okay, so let's see here. It's telling us. Wow, that's an awful lot of information it's telling us. Oh, it told us, um, for some reason, it decided to show us the entire deploy script. That's marvelous. Thank you, Salt Cloud. I don't know why it's doing that. Where in the heck is the top of this thing? I might run out of buffer here. Okay, we're out of buffer. We can't actually get the IP of our systems, but we can do it another way. Let's see, um, this is self 2019-web1. Well, first of all, let's just make sure it's connected. Mike, I may need you again. You're my hero, Mike. Much easier to type with two hands. Uh-oh. Oh, 2109, whoops. I'm gonna blame that on having one hand. Okay, good. We have our web node, we have our DB node. Good, okay, so now we should be able to, um, web one grains dot item IPv4, I think is what it is. Okay, there we go, there's our IP. Let's go see if Nginx is active on it. Nope, okay, let's see. Oops, on that same node. Oh, that's right, okay. Let's just do like that and let it do its thing. The heck you say? I literally just ran this before we came in here. Hmm. Okay, there's our top file. Let's make sure I didn't overwrite my file roots. That looks right to me. Okay, let's just try a state that apply. This is what always happens in every presentation. It looks great, works great before you walk in and then boom, it just stops working. Let's just directly apply. I think it's cord on Nginx. Nope. Oh, let's go, that's a good point. Let's go see what the grain is. Um, so one grains dot, what was it, self demo, I think? Demo roll, that's what it was. Thank you. Okay, so it does have the demo roll. I guess it's just, maybe the reason it didn't run is because for whatever reason it can't find my top file. I don't know why I can't find the top file. It's right there. Oh, that's supposed to be core of Nginx. Let's do this, just apply Nginx. Find it? Nope. 
Yay, something I've changed recently. Let's go look at this. It says that's not a dictionary. Does that look like a YAML dictionary to you guys? It doesn't? Yeah, it says that's, it doesn't in Ansible. It's a little different, but. Package dot install. Let's just go look at what it says to do and copy it. Oh, there, I see, I don't like this. They use these examples. I don't specify. Package install. Fine. You know what? We're going to do it that way. We'll just do it like that. Wait, so it doesn't need that first dash? Okay. Like that. And it also doesn't need a trailing there. Okay, so we'll try it now. That looks good, it didn't immediately respond. Thank you. I was dinking around with my, trying to create a better cluster example before I got in here. I was actually trying to seed it with a real working tool. But okay, there we are, now it's installed into Nginx. We should be able to go over here. And we should see our Nginx. Yay, welcome to Nginx. So let's pretend that it ran that properly because I had properly formatted the file. We'll just kind of all one wink, wink, nod, nod, right? Yeah, okay. So pretend that it also worked on the database. And at that point, we would probably, because we're deploying an actual cluster that does an actual thing, we would have more state files that would deploy our software, check it out from Git, do whatever. Um, all the other state file things that SaltStack does, we would include that in there. And um, it may be there was an option in Bootstrap I missed to tell it to explicitly run the high state. So one of the things I have done um, when I'm provisioning stuff is I would de declare an extra entry in the salt minion configuration that tells it on startup run this state. And I actually had this very complicated pipeline with deploy steps. And so when you first, we saw when we logged into that system and had all these package updates to run the kernels probably, out of, well, it's, well, no, they do the kernel. But like on another system, if you're managing your own kernel, the kernel's out of date because you're just coming from the LTS. So step one would be update all the packages that are on the system and reboot. So that would be step one. And I had this pipeline that would send an event back from the minion to the master saying, okay, we've completed step one, and the master would advance it to step two, like this little ratchet thing. It would just step through the deploy process, and all the different pieces, the different pieces of the cluster would, at the point where they diverged, they would just run only the states that were meaningful for it. So I didn't want to go too deep into this because this is a very, very deep hole, and it's a very amazingly powerful tool with lots and lots of little niches here, there, everywhere. But I didn't want to get into it too far. So let's see, is there anything else in here that I was trying to cover? I think not. Um, question. The question was, he builds images uh, with Packer or some other tool. And he wants to install SaltMinion without configuring it ahead of time. And the answer is yes. If SaltMinion has, Salt has no configuration, it will generate its default when it runs the first time. Likewise, um, every SaltMinion has a key pair. And if it starts up and sees, oh, I don't have a key pair, it will generate one. And it's instructed to um, either in the configuration file or as part of Etsy host or something. It's going to look for the master. It's looking for a host name named Salt. So if you were to seed the Salt master's IP in the host file with the tag assault, it would automatically connect. And at that point, because salt master doesn't know the system's coming ahead of time, you would see it um, show up in the salt key. And you would have to specifically, promote, uh, I guess promote is the right word, promote that key to, okay, I understand what you are, you're allowed. At that point, it's, it's brought in. So that, I, I've done it that way too. I actually, it's a little faster to do it that way because we see salt cloud can be a bit sluggish, right? So. But there's nothing quite like it for just bringing it right in and, and spooling up a cluster. I mean, it doesn't matter where you're going to. Like, I was using Vagrant to do some of these things, and there's a couple of providers in Vagrant, but there's nothing like the support that SaltCloud has. And I, since I've moved over to using SaltCloud, I've been a lot happier. I was going to try and actually do an example where I put the DB on the node and a web over on Rackspace and have them talk together, but there was some firewall problems, and I decided to just drop that. But it's very possible. There's no reason you couldn't do that. There's no reason you couldn't do that in the same map file, even because you're just specifying what profile to use, and the profile specifies what provider to use. So all of it is eminently flexible. Do we have other questions? Another question. Uh, 
it was a, it started the question was is it a, a community project or is it an official product it started off as a community project and then about four years ago it moved into salt stack formal so it's now versioned along with everything else um, and coming from having used this four years ago when it was still an independent tool um, sometimes I forget and I go and try and install salt cloud from pip and it just doesn't work so you don't need to do that it just comes straight with your salt stack deployment which, by the way, the best way, in my opinion, to get salt stack is not to use a system package. I would just go straight from PIP because it's always going to have the latest versions. And uh, one company I was doing, they were required to use packages from a known good package source for security reasons. So we were getting salt stack from Apple, and that was very long in tooth, and it was very annoying. So if it's at all possible, best to come from PIP and try and stay within a version of the most recent because they're good on stability, and it's helpful. Question. Oh, that's right. Yeah, they do now. I don't ever use it, but uh, there's install installation instructions for almost every operating system out there, and a lot of them have their own repos already built. So they didn't used to do that. They're doing it now. So that's good. That would have solved my problem a couple years ago. Other questions, comments? In the back. The question was if there are other tools kind of included with salt stack that we could try without having to bring three kitchen sinks in, if I understand your question correctly. There's a couple. Let's go see in here what else. My tab completion is not working. Okay, here we go. So there's other ways to invoke salt that don't require setting up a master. For instance, you can have a, a local only instance using salt call, and salt call is a way of tricking a minion into thinking a master is giving it a command, even though the command is coming from the local system. So if you just want to play with salt, just stick it on a system and start making salt calls. And you can apply your states or do whatever you want as if it was coming from a master without having to create two VMs. There's also other... Oh, okay, excuse me. You can set local. Okay. I think I have an alias that does it because I haven't thought about it. Yeah. Um, let's see. Other tools. I don't remember what salt CP does. Do you remember what that does? I don't ever use it. Oh, okay. So using the salt bus, it copies a file from wherever you're making the command to the menu you specify. So like, I need to update this configuration file on this one system, and I don't want to write a state for it. Just freaking do it. Just salt CP it. Okay, great. Um, and there's some other tools in here. I don't know what salt unity is for. I've never used it before. Oh, wow. Salt unity combines all the commands together. I should probably look at that. So I don't have to think as hard. Um, so there are some other tools kind of floating around, and um, there's some other pieces that you can bring in. We haven't even talked about things like the reactor and all these other pieces that are built into Salt that you'll probably run into if you start doing complicated pipelines um, that may not have their own specific invocations. So like I was talking earlier about my provisioning pipeline from before. I had these event states, so I would set up something to listen on the master for an event coming from the minion that said a certain thing, like, I'm done with this step. And then it would send the event back. The master would pick it up with the little event handler and do something, get ready for the next step, tell it to reboot, any, any number of things. That's just baked into salt that you can play with without needing to pull down another kitchen sink. So, have I answered your question? Okay. Other questions, comments? Yes, sir. Yes, the events are passing over that ZRMQ bus. Yes, you can, actually. Let's do that. Uh, I believe it is salt run. State that event. Thank you, Mike. I think that's it. Yay, okay, so now we're tapped in. Here, I'm going to do this. So now it's at the top of our screen. And let's go test up ping something. Okay, so if we go back over to our event, we'll see two events here. One is the outgoing. That was the command out to the system right there. And then this is the return from the menu saying, here's the response to the job you just created. And it's actually pretty fun to watch this, especially if you're trying to troubleshoot your very complicated deploy pipeline with lots of events. You kind of need to do this. Now, you don't need to look at every event because especially on a busy system with lots of minions, there's going to be tons of things going across every 
in hours they are rehashing to make sure that their security hasn't changed and you, know, you probably have periodic stuff you're running and high states and all this stuff. So when you run this command, you probably want to filter. Oh, hush, go away. There's a way to do a tag equals, and you can filter on just certain event tags. So like when you're, when you're declaring your events, thank you, when you're declaring your events for your provisioning pipeline, you get to name the events. So you can name it something peculiar like Pelican if you want, and you can just do a search on Pelican, and it'll only show you events that are named or have Pelican in the name of the event, stuff like that. So you can watch this. It's actually pretty cool to watch what's happening. It really exposes the internals, and you realize, okay, for all its complexity, SaltStack actually doesn't have that much depth. It's just doing this. All it does is it puts a command on the bus, and the minion does everything else. So and you had a question, Mike. Okay, so the question was discussing the differences between salt stack and Ansible, knowing that salt stack is that master minion system and Ansible is just the simple push via SSH. Um, I actually prefer Ansible for small things because it's very easy to get in and declare, uh, but I don't like it anytime you have to do anything complicated. And uh, Ansible was designed to be very, very simple. And it's great. It means you can get in and jump in and do something fast, but it means it doesn't support some things that I like. And it's also more difficult to support patterns like don't repeat yourself. It's actually somewhat difficult to implement in Ansible. You have to go and call a task and a role and do an include, and it's actually a little cantankerous. It stinks. But in salt stack, that's easy. It's just a simple include. So the second I need something more complicated than what Ansible can do easily, that's when I prefer to hop over to salt stack. And where Ansible has no equivalent, like in creating and provisioning VMs, I use salt stack there for sure. I have done a lot of my personal automation in both, more as just to make sure I'm keeping my skills sharp. I tend to use Ansible because it's easier to do quick stuff. But like I'm about to build a new pipeline for a client now, and we're gonna have to use SaltCloud to do the beginning of it, and it's up in the air whether we're going to use Ansible, which we've already invested in, and SaltStack, which does the pieces we can't do yet. So I don't have a good answer. Um, personal preference just lays in, lay in how complicated the thing is I'm trying to do. Question, comment. Ah, yes, he pointed out that I do not have salt SSH, and he noticed that because my tab completion wasn't working. So, salt SSH, uh, this goes back to the gentleman in the back with the question about can I use tools that are associated with it without incorporating yet another kitchen sink. Salt SSH lets you pretend like you're got a minion on a remote system, but you're really just using SSH. Exactly what Ansible does. In fact, the code is pretty similar. They're probably using the same library calls underneath to do it. But they're, both Ansible and Salt Stack, what they're doing is they're creating an on-the-fly Python script with all the things you've told it to do, downloading it to the system with using 0MQ and Salt Stack and SSH and Ansible and running it there. So. That's what's happening in the background, and the vehicle in which the script gets to the system kind of doesn't matter as much. So if you'd want to go a little bit simpler, you don't have to do all this master minion crap or key handling and all that stuff, just use salt SSH. Works great. Any other questions or comments? All right, guys, thanks for coming. Appreciate it.